Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kasha. I am the Product Marketing Manager here at Access Pay. And um, thank you so much for joining us today to uh, discover everything about uh, the hidden risks of manual banking processes. So I'm joined today by my wonderful colleague, Tom. Would you like to give yourself a quick introduction, Tom? Thanks, Kasha. Um, uh, so good morning, everybody. My name is Tom Levick. I'm the Head of Enterprise Sales for Access Pay. Thank you all for joining. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to this session about how we can uncover those hidden risks of uh, manual banking processes. Uh, I've been with the company for about 10 years and uh, I look after our larger organisations, uh, such as ITV, Primark and Standard Life. Thank you, Tom. So I would hedge my bets that Tom has had thousands of conversations um, around the topics that we're going to discuss today over his 10-year period with Access Pay. So who, per, who, who better, basically, than to uh, talk about this topic with us today than Tom? So uh, before I get started, just a couple of uh, things to mention very quickly. Um, this, sec this session is completely interactive. So if you have any thoughts, any questions or comments, then please feel free to put those in the comment section, whether you're on LinkedIn or YouTube, and we will cover those throughout the session. And we'll probably make some time for any other questions that come through at the end as well. Um, the other point to make is that um, this is just one session in a series of many. So Finance Transformation Unlocked is a monthly series that we uh, put on at Access Pay. So if you're interested in, well, if you enjoy uh, the discussion today, um, you can stay notified about new episodes and watch back on previous episodes by following us on LinkedIn um, or subscribing to uh, our channel. Um, we will have a link in the comments below at some point um, towards the end of the session. Um, so to get things started, Tom, I guess the most obvious place to start would be what do we actually mean when we say manual banking processes? What part of the process are we referring to there? Sure. Uh, so if you think about a, an organisation that's processing any type of payment, whether it's pay payroll or direct debit collections, a treasury a transaction, a treasury payment, pay, uh, expenses, for example, even supplier payments, it starts with a back office system. So the process actually starts with a back office system that's generating a payment file. So prior to actually the file being loaded into the bank or, or the payment being delivered to the bank, there is a process that happens within that back office system. Uh, and actually, it's, it's not, just to be clear, it's not that process we're referring to today. It's, it's once that file has been generated, how that payment file or that payment instruction then gets to the bank. And typically... There is a, a team of people who are logging into bank portals and either uploading a payment file from that back office system or even worse they're actually manually typing into the bank portal that that payment instruction mm -hmm. so that's one part of the cycle and the other part is then the those same people potentially could then be logging into the bank portal to download statement data for reconciliation purposes and working out what their liquidity is and they're taking that statement information and uploading it into either uh, an ERP system like SAP or, or Oracle or others, or potentially they could be uploading it into a treasury management system or reconciliation engine. Yeah, makes sense. So essentially it's it's that vehicle through which you, you manage the, the payment lifecycle and essentially transferring data from A to B. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's the bit, as I said, it's the bit that we're focusing on today is actually how how that 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 data, whether it's a payment instruction or or statement information, how that either gets to the bank or from the bank. Yeah, perfect. So uh, if I was ask you to quick fire summarise in three four points, what do you believe are the biggest challenges? Um, are the biggest risks that you see around those processes? Yes. So um, the, the first one is is really human resources. So it's the efficiency part. It's because I've got, um, whether it's one person, if it's a small organization or on a large organization, there could be literally teams of people who are logging into bank portals and um, uh, making those payments. 
the, the second then is human error. So it's the fact that we're all human and at some point somebody's going to make a mistake. And then the third one is around whether it's internal or external fraud, there's a security risk because of the fact that you're using a, a, a bank portal to make those payments or download statement data. Yeah, there's a, there's a quite a lot to unpack there in each of those points. So uh, we're just going to go through each of those points that you've just mentioned in a little bit more detail. Uh, so the first point you covered uh, was around human resources. So I imagine there's both tangible and intangible risk there um, when we talk about the impact on human resource. Yes. So if you think about what, what what's actually happening, you've got a, a, a team, I'd just say a team of people, that, that, whether it's a cashiering team or accounts payable um, or a reconciliation team or even a treasury team, that depending on the, type, the, the size of the organization, the type of organization, there could be multiple teams who are logging into bank portals. So in some organizations, we're not just talking about one team. There could be multiple teams. And then if you think about that for a global organization, they could then have actually teams in different locations around the world who are logging into bank portals uh, in, in those regions. So this is around the efficiency part of having to have those people who, even though the payment file could be generated from that Oracle, that uh, SAP system, Microsoft Dynamics, uh, NetSuite, whatever it is, um, that file is coming out. But actually, the, the process to get that file into the bank for settlement is a manual process rather than it being automated. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess around the efficiency piece, it's kind of like the question to be asked is, A, could my staff be making better use of their time? And B, what is the actual cost to my organisation of us working in this way? So obviously with human resource, it's, it's quite easy to, to calculate the cost of what that would be and doing that process, you know, it's just... How many hours is this taking a week? What is the cost um, of those staff doing that role per hour? Um, and and there you can you've got a, a tangible a tangible uh, sort of cost that you can apply to that process. So imagine if you've got a lot of people involved um, in doing that process, that 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 cost is going to rack up sufficiently over time. Absolutely. Yeah. So what we tend to see sitting in the sales team when we're engaging with new prospects is the customer's always wanting is interested in wanting to know what's the business case what's what's the justification for this project for for moving away from a, a manual process using those using those bank portals to an automated process and as you said this, this is very much a tangible cost um the fact that actually let's say there are five people in an accounts payable team and typically what we can see uh, from our other customers uh, is that typically we're going to automate 90% of that process. So we're not going to be able to automate all of it for lots of different reasons, but where we can, 90% uh, is typically what we're seeing. So that that so, so rather than having five people in that organization, um, we're going to see, um, so, you know, it's a lot less than, you know, less than one person who is then still processing those um, manual payments. So that's the, that's the real business case. That's the real... A justification the efficiency piece that comes out from that and and you think about these people these are these are actually very intelligent highly qualified people that have gone to work for an organization and they're given what effectively is a mundane task to log into a bank portal to process payments and surely it's better to have that type of skill in the business to go and do something that's more that has much more value to the organization than simply typing into a, a bank portal yeah, absolutely. So I guess there's a, a job satisfaction and a, a talent retention angle to this as well. Where it, yeah, yeah. It's, it, if you think about it, it's both sides, isn't it? it? It's it's the employee who's given a mundane task to do. They've spent three years, however long in university, they come out and do this mundane task. And then for the employer, it's how do I re want to retain that talent and make sure that, that we put them on the career path within the organization to keep them and nurture them and so actually this this uh, moving away from a, a manual banking process actually is going to help that organization do those both things absolutely yeah i guess from the organization's perspective as well it's it's kind of 
where where are you going to get the most value out of that talent as well? Uh, are, they, are they better placed on doing things that are fr- that are frankly repeatable, or are they better maybe looking at projects that are potentially more value add and can actually contribute towards improving the bottom line of the organisation? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, they're sitting in the finance organisation, so they're in a good, really good place to help with finance transformation projects and finance transformation applies right across the organization right it doesn't necessarily just have to be around banking portals that we're talking about today finance transformation could apply in various different areas of the the business yeah absolutely so i guess that kind of segues very nicely into the second point that you mentioned at the start of the session um around human error um so in, in your experience, what does that look like and what's the impact on um, organisations that you've spoken to um, about this? Yes. So the human error is, it, it, unfortunately, we are all human, of course, and, and at some point uh, a mistake will be made, whether it's a decimal point in the wrong place or a, a name typed in incorrectly or, or some other issue with, with the payment. And what then happens is, is if that payment then gets sent, is actually is actually delivered to the bank. So it's actually there. It's actually in the bank portal, and and it's been then being processed by the bank. There, there are t- there are a number of repercussions because of that. Mm-hmm. The, the first is is then d- does it get spotted at that point? Has it been actually identified mm-hmm. as 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 soon as it's been typed in and as soon as the payment has been d- d- been instructed? Um, does the organization does the person realize that that payment is is the wrong is is an error um if they do then they can do something about it and the impact may be slightly less than actually if it's not spotted as an error so then what happens mm. is the bank actually process processes that transaction and let's say um we were paying uh just, just paying a supplier payment then if i've paid it I've, if i've paid the wrong amount let's say in this case, um, and I've paid less, then I could get penalized by the supplier to say, actually, this is a late payment. You haven't paid enough. Therefore, it then gets escalated back into the business. And it's no longer just that cashier, that person in the accounts payable team who gets involved in addressing that, it will get escalated up the business. And so whether that gets to the head of the, the cashiering team, mm-hmm. the head of the payments team, or even further to head of finance or even CFO level, the, the, this is no longer just around that single person who's who's trying to address this. This is many people in the organisation trying to address that human error. Mm. So I guess again, it's, it goes back to that efficiency piece. It's like, is it is is it worth having all of this resource allocated to this role if this keeps happening over and over again? It keeps having to get escalated, um, and essentially processes have to be repeated multiple times so you're essentially paying for the price of twice um and i guess on the other end of the spectrum as well there's i mean i've certainly heard about scenarios where um errors are made and companies find it very difficult to actually get that money back yeah so um if they then the payment is is then delivered to the beneficiary and actually maybe in this case let's say they've paid too much so they actually want to refund what's the process for getting that money back from from that organization and that can be an extremely lengthy process and again involve multiple people in the organization just because somebody put the decimal point in the wrong place mm, absolutely and if if that payment goes out to perhaps a, a customer who isn't part of an organization i don't know if you're uh, an insurance company or a lender or something and you're making a payout to a customer there's nothing to stop that customer running away <laughs> with the money and just being being forgotten for good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and and all because the Tom had a late night or or wasn't <laughs> feeling very well, uh, and and a, and a, an error has been made. It, it, mm-hmm. You know, it's, there are other ways that that we can address this issue. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and the the third and final point that you mentioned um, was all around internal and external fraud, which is certainly a, a massive growing concern for organisations. Um, certainly, um, fraud is on the rise exponentially across every single sector. Um, so 
what what does the impact look like look like there and how common is it from what you've seen so far yeah. so th this is out of the three uh, points on the slide this is probably the one that that um has um the biggest can have the biggest impact across the organization I, i'm not saying that fraud happens um a lot but it's definitely as you said it's definitely on the rise and both from external attacks as well as internal fraud as well so both uh, needs to be mitigated against as the as the business and um just just to just take the analogy that you know, I, I've, I've joined this new organization and isn't it wonderful Tom's sitting there and he's and the organization says that's fine Tom there's the bank details please log in and start making these payments and you take that yourself as an, an individual you probably wouldn't share your bank details with your closest friends or even family and here's an organization who's quite happily sharing their their bank details now of course that organization will put controls and measures around it but what happens if that that, that peer person was then colluding or even if they had found a way around that and was actually um uh, trying to defraud the organization yeah it's so true i mean uh, the, a few weeks ago, actually, I was doing one of these internal cybersecurity training courses that, that we have to complete every now and again. And there was a point on there around um, high risk users um, and high risk users aren't necessarily someone who is going to attempt to defraud your organization or they're, they're bad at their job and they're going to make loads of mistakes. It's people who have access to sensitive um systems that if that uh, that those login credentials were intercepted then it would have a huge impact on the organization so the more people who essentially have access to these what are deemed high risk systems the more likelihood there is just by maths that you're going to be susceptible to things like fraud occurring and and breaches taking place um so it's definitely something to consider about how widely that information is shared and how widely those systems are accessed and used yeah for, for sure um i i actually th just this morning i received an email from um a a new customer they're a law firm they're a uk law firm and if i can just quote what they 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 put in their, their message so this was around the conversation was around um looking at different payment types and the consideration was they've got a fairly high volume of payments mm. going through as faster payments and chaps but actually they have a number of us dollar payments and the quote that they, they this straight from the email is the purpose of this project is to minimize our risk and exposure on high volume and and high value payments international us dollars doesn't represent a high risk given the various complex sorry does rep represent a high risk given the various complexity stages involved in the payment process here. So it needs to be an integral part of the initial rollout. So that the, the point there is, is that actually it's, even though these were relatively small uh, in terms of volume, so in other words, it's not the first point, which is we've got a team of people who are processing payments. This is around the risk to the business because there are treasury payments and high value. And even though there's a relatively low volume of these payments maybe one or two a day they don't want to take the risk of of having even the, tr the treasury person accessing the bank portal to process them and also the risk of those those payments being made incorrectly they want to mitigate that and put an automated process in place so exactly to the point we're we're talking about yeah absolutely i mean uh it's certainly something that that i've seen just speaking to well being involved in various conversations over the last 12 months or so um that the the there's a there's a real what once once this happens to an organization it's it's unquestionable that it needs solving but unfortunately a lot of the times until that happens or until it happens that it's starting to happen uh quite regularly um i think organizations up until the last few years have tended to kind of just carry on as per um yeah that kind of leads me on to the next point which i think is really intertwined with um this whole fraud prevention um which is there's there's very much like a 
a compliance and regulatory angle um, around this whole point as well. Um, I know that over the last couple of years and the couple of years to come, there's a lot of changes in financial regulations that are on the horizon, like um, UK SOX, for example, with PLCs, that is very um, heavily focused around things like operational resilience and fraud prevention. And it's the same again for financial services um, companies with um, new FCA regulations around operational resilience. And um, I believe a similar legislation is coming into place in the EU very soon as well. So this focus on operational resilience um, is very much at the forefront for businesses at the moment. Um, which kind of makes sense because of all the things that have happened this decade so far, like a pandemic, um, all of the the political stuff that's happening across the world at the moment. It's kind of shifted a lot of um, companies' focuses towards ensuring that they're future-proofing themselves against these sorts of risks and that they can operate in times of uh what's the word in, in times of um hardship i guess yeah it, the, the whole um shift as you said the shift in the market um with regulation now not just being applied to um l- larger organizations but the the law firm i just mentioned that they'll be regulated by the solicitors regulation authority so the sra and and so actually regulation is is now going to apply to most organizations and will become a standard of how do I prove not just internally, but how do I prove to my suppliers and my customers that I am um, I, I have the right processes in place. Um, so that's the first point. But then the second is if you have a manual process, wh- how do you then uh, show from an audit point of view that you are compliant with those regulations? it makes it much harder because you've got a manual process than to actually become compliant and and deliver those audit reports that you need to to then say that you are in line with the regulation so it's a double whammy effectively it's yeah i need to be compliant how can i show i'm compliant if i've got a manual process yeah that's a really good point even just preparing for these audits in itself isn't easy and like if you uh, having to map out your people process technology against processes that are primarily manual, you're going to have to be considering a hell of a lot of risk factors against those processes. Mm. Um, whereas if you if you if you go with the view of trying to simplify that down and maybe cutting out some of those risk factors from your processes, then it becomes a bit easier to map those processes out at the point of audit. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, this this is where you know, we started the conversation around bank portals and, and efficiency. And actually, we've really got down into the weeds. And now we're talking about regulation and the impact on the business. And, and we're not saying that these two things are separate. They're actually, the, it's the same conversation, but actually it becomes a much bigger conversation, not just about human efficiency, but about regulation for the organization. Exactly, yeah. Because especially if you if you're dealing with multiple banking partners, multiple accounts, um, how many accounts are you going to have to log into to be able to audit your transactions and get that that information that you're going to need for things like UK SOCs or FCA audits or whatever it may be. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm very uh, conscious that for the past 20 minutes or so, we've mainly talked about problems. Um, so I guess the the logical uh, question to ask Tom is, so what is the what is the solution to all of this? Yeah, so I, I guess I hinted at this just before. So, so the banks do offer alternatives to bank portals. And the question, and, and as you mentioned, Kasia, it, it's just become standard that the bank portal is, is is the solution for how do I get my payments and how do I get my statement data? But there are alternatives. And um, the, the, as I mentioned, the banks offer a number of them and, and they're actually shown here. So that, so you can see on the right hand side that um, Bax has been around for a very long time, over 40 years, faster payments, host to host connections, Swift or APIs are all solutions that the banks offer. So that corporate organization, that, that business could connect to the bank using those means and they could effectively connect themselves to to the bank without using a third party like 
like access pay. So there is an option where they use a DIY. We would we would refer it to as a do it yourself, so a DIY solution. The reason why that becomes more complicated for most organisations is that um, it's not necessarily the bank connectivity which is showing on the right hand side of this slide, but actually the point that's uh, on the top of the slide, which is file transformation. Uh, and effectively what's happening is those back office systems don't generate a bank ready file, a bank ready payment file. So somewhere in the mix, a bank ready payment file has to be generated that the bank would then receive. And this becomes really complicated if either there are multiple back office systems. So let's say you've got Chrome River for expenses, you might be using NetSuite for your ERP, and then you've got a, a separate payroll system. So three back office systems having to generate a bank ready payment file, that becomes really difficult to manage. Uh, and obviously, if you go to a multi-banked, an organization that's multi-banked and multi-geoed, in other words, different countries, this then becomes an even more difficult issue and where most organizations would, would come to access pay to say, we need some help with this process. So, um, Kasia, if it's okay, I'll just spend a, a conscious of the time. So I'll just spend a few minutes, a few seconds, just going around the top of the, the slide and then the statement coming around the bottom. Of course, yeah. So the back, the, it's showing on the left-hand side of the back office system and a payment file coming out from that. We would then connect to that back office system using uh, either SFTP or an API service to connect into that back office system. We then receive the file and access pay is sitting in the middle. We then go through a validation process, security and control, which obviously is really important. So this is both a, an approval level. So we approve the payment file if it's not been approved, but then we've got some security and control measures that would detect if it was a duplicate file, duplicate transaction, or even a new beneficiary that was being paid and flag that to the users. And then the final part of the process, as I mentioned, transforming the file into create a bank ready file, irrespective of which bank, which country and payment type. We then manage the bank connection going into the bank and the bank will then send back um, initially a payment status report so that the payment status report gives the confirmation that the bank is either processing the payment or not. In other words, it's not yet settled. And then following the, the payment status report, the bank will send back the statement data. So the statement data can then be used for reconciliation in the back office system, and it can also be used to work out what liquidity I've got in my uh, in my business. Mm -hmm. So just going back to those three points you were making earlier, Tom, around resource, human error, fraud and security. So obviously, by the fact, by the very nature of all of these connections being fully automated, you're kind of immediately cutting out the the issues with the resource the issues with error but then on this the security point that's kind of a the point that i'd like to delve into a little bit more here because there's additional controls on top of what uh, basically on top of everything else that's going on in here that can basically guarantee that the internal control mechanisms that you may have internally are going to be guaranteed essentially um like with uh, a bank portal there's no real way to guarantee that what you've agreed to put in place across at, at group level you may have various finance teams operating um there's no guarantee that those processes are being followed but something like this makes sure that those processes are followed down to a t yeah so i, th I think the key point here is is that a bank portal is a very um, specific type of service that the bank is providing uh, based on what the bank is, is offering. Access Pay is a configurable application based on what our customers want and their processes for, like you mentioned, security, control and risk. What does that look like? And it may vary. So, for example, payroll is probably extremely important in terms of the file getting to the bank. But the security and control measures around it may say, well, OK, as long as nobody else can see this, I don't care. The file can go straight to the bank. In mm -hmm. fact, it needs to go to the bank as soon as possible because we all need to get paid. But a treasury payment or a supplier payment that and, and I keep going back to the law firm just because, uh, you know, they came up today in the conversation. So in law firms, they have client money, which is even more important. 
And, and so they, those types of payments may need the tightest types of controls measures around them. So actually, as the, as the file comes into Access Pay, we're going to apply a whole range of different control measures to it to make sure that it's, it, it, is, it is a correct payment. It isn't a duplicate. It's not that it, you, you, you're paying, if you're paying somebody the first time, it's being flagged and so on. So mm -hmm. it is very configurable depending on the organization and the payment types. Yeah. Um, and I think final question, just to wrap this up really quickly, Tom, I know we are slightly going over the 30 minutes promise, but um, I think it's worth asking. Um, so if if someone's watching today and they're resonating with um, the, the points that we were discussing um, earlier, they understand that they have these problems. What um, advice would you give um, to those people around how to start combating uh, these these problems like where would you start yeah so a good starting point is always which back office systems are you wanting to process your your, your automate your your payments and um, what payment types are, are you wanting to send to the bank from those back office systems so those those two really sort of help to define the nature of the project and it might be that some of our customers will say actually i'm not interested in payments I'm more actually interested about statement data. So actually the focus changes from being a payment conversation to being statement led. So bank feed and getting that data for reconciliation purposes. And then one, having had that conversation, the next is, okay, so which banks are you wanting to connect to, whether it's for payments or statements and, um, and the payment types you're wanting to make to those banks. And with that information, we would then be able to give some advice back as to how long it would take for the, pro the, the project, the scope of the project, and, uh, and the cost of that. And obviously the cost is, as mentioned before, it's really important because actually there's got to be a business case that stacks up for the, the automation piece. And it, whether that's based on efficiency, whether that's based on human error and some experiences that an organization has had with human error, or whether it's a security and the whole SOX compliance regulation that we talked about earlier, those could be the reason for the business case. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Tom. Um, I've certainly enjoyed uh, this discussion today and I hope everyone Likewise. listening has as well. Um, it doesn't look like we've had any um, questions through in the comments, but we have had a few compliments, which is nice. <laughs> um, but just wanted to say thank you very much uh, to everyone for taking the time out of your day for joining us today. Um, and like I mentioned at the start, if you would be interested in catching the next episode uh looking back at previous episodes um of this series then there should be a link in the comments on linkedin for you to subscribe and stay up to date so thank you and have a have a good rest of the day thanks everyone bye